Let me begin, though, by again wishing you dads a happy Father's Day. And uh, it made me think about the origin of this day, and it actually it happened. It took place over in Spokane, and uh, that was uh, by, uh, well, June 19, 1910, by Sonora Smart Dodd. Her father was a Civil War veteran, William Jackson Smart. He was a single parent, parent who raised six children. And uh, Sarah, I mean, Sonora Smart Dodd thought, well, they celebrate Mother's Day. They ought to have something for Father's Day, thinking about her own dad. And in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson went to Spokane to speak at a Father's Day celebration. But it was not until 1966 that President Lyndon Bain Johnson issued the first presidential proclamation honoring fathers, designating the third Sunday in June as Father's Day. Six years later, though, took, uh, it was made a permanent national holiday when President Richard M. Nixon signed it into law on April 24th, 1972. By the way, uh, 62 years after uh, Sonora Smart Dodd tried to make it a holiday. So, hey, keep at it. It works finally. Okay. <laughs> so happy Father's Day. Well, on this Father's Day, though, I'd like to talk to you about that. And my message is entitled, as you can see from uh, the outline you have in the bulletin, I really want to encourage you to take that outline and fill it out and give it some thought. Just give it some thought. It's a simple outline that God may use in your life as I want him to use it in mine. But I've entitled the message to you, Learning to Know Your Father This Father's Day. A little bit different. Learning to Know Your Father This Father's Day. Father's Day. This morning's text is just three verses long, and it comes from 1 John 2, verses 12 through 14, so you may want to turn there on your smartphone or your Bible, whichever, okay? 1 John 2, 12 through 14, and here's how these verses read. You're very familiar with them, but listen to it again. The Apostle John, the aged apostle, says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven. Uh, you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you have known him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you children because you know the father. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong, and the Word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, we don't want to miss the theme of this short letter that the Apostle John writes to these believers, as well as to you and me. It's actually found in chapter 1, verse 4. He says, these things we write. Well, John, why do you write these things? So that our joy may be made complete. And then John expands that theme and further explains it in verse 7 of 1 John 1. He says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, here it goes, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I think you can readily see that your joy is directly tied to your fellowship with your heavenly father. Thank you. I told him he had to do that once in a while to keep me going. (laughs) I love it. And God, your heavenly Father, wants you to have and enjoy to the fullest this fellowship with him. This little letter we call 1 John describes you and that fellowship and the wonderful joy this fellowship with your heavenly Father produces in your life. That's why the title of the message, as you can see there, Learning to Know God or Learning to Know Your Father this Father's Day. As I said, my outline is there. Please use it. It's a simple outline. If you're home and don't have it, you can easily write it down. It's very simple. And uh, just give it some serious thought. So let's begin with our first major point here in the outline. Knowing your father as his child Knowing your father as his child. I begin by stating this is important. Beware of doing what a number of commentators do with these three verses. 
I say they chase a rabbit's trail, okay? And you might tend to do that as well. They chase a rabbit's tra trail, and they miss the great impact your Heavenly Father planned for you to receive from these three verses. How do they do that? Well, they place their entire focus on the children, the young men, and the fathers being the three stages of spiritual growth and maturity in one's Christian life and journey. And they also conclude that possibly John has written this and describes these three stages because he thinks that maybe some of the readers here aren't really saved. And then, of course, he's concerned that some lack the assurance of their salvation, and so he wants to drive that home. By the way, he does that last part through this epistle, this little letter. But to go that direction, folks, with these three verses is to completely miss John's purpose, as well as miss what your heavenly Father, thinking of Father's Day, desires for these verses to do in your life. Knowing your Father as his child. By the way, if John was trying to focus strictly on the three stages of your Christian life, you start out as a child, an infant, and then you progress as a maturing young man who's overcoming the evil one, and finally you're a seasoned father, you would think that would be his progression here, but that's not what he does at all. So why do you write two different times, little children, then what? Fathers. And then what? Young men. Twice he does that. Surely he would have written little children, young men, and fathers if his focus was meant to be on your progressive growth in spiritual maturity. But further, but further, throughout this entire letter, the Apostle John addresses all three, the children, the young men, and the fathers as what? My little children. Look at me back at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, he says. Remember now, he's addressing all three. The little children, if you please, the young men, the fathers. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Do you think the young men ever sin? <laughs> you think the old fathers ever sin? Certainly he does. So you may not sin and so forth. Again, verse 12, he says, verse 2, I am writing to you, little children, there it is again, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. Do you think that the young men have had their sins forgiven? The fathers as well? Certainly they have. Look down at chapter 2, verse 28. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. And then capture what he says in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now don't miss it. Notice what he says. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on what? Who? Us. John includes himself. I'd say he's a father. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. There it is again. Children of God. And such we are for this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. John includes himself, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And there's other portions that, in fact, folks, 12 different times, 12 different times in this little letter, John addresses all these believers, all of them, as my little children. Now, that word in Greek is technia. It means born ones, and that's a rich word. That's a precious word, born ones. I do not mean to apply, though, that the Bible does, says nothing about growing spiritually and maturing in your Christian life. It does. It does. In fact, uh, in 1 John 2, 12 through 14, these verses before us, it may even to some extent allude to that, of course. But, dear ones, that is not the impact of these three verses. Keep the focus where the Apostle John and the Holy Spirit wants that focus to be, Learning to know your heavenly father. So knowing your father as a child, number one. Okay, we're finally getting to the outline. Great. <laughs> knowing your father as a child because God has completely forgiven you. What a wonderful, profound thought and truth. Verse 12, I am writing to you little children because your sins have been 
forgiven for his name's sake. As I said 12 times, this letter John addresses all the readers, all of them, as my little children, or simply as children, and again, it means born ones, born ones. Folks, John does not question their salvation here. They have gotten born again into God's family by placing their faith in His Son and His atoning work that He completed for them on the cross. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Do you get that? You must be born again. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. (laughs) I love how Peter the Apostle put it. He describes our being born again, born again in 2 Peter 1, 4. For by these, and he means God's glory and excellence, by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them, here it goes, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Can you fathom that? Where's the amens to that? that you and I may become partakers of God's divine nature. That's being born into the family of God, dear ones. Wow. When you become a partaker of God's divine nature and you are born again, God completely forgives all your sin. Incomprehensible. Glorious. Wonderful. I take you back to that time when God confronted you with your sin because you don't get saved until that happens. I take you back to that time when God confronted you with your sin and your eyes were open and you realized this holy God had to deal in absolute justice with you because of your sin. You were spiritually dead in your trespasses and sins, the Bible says. And you knew that you deserved hell, right? That's right. And this thrice holy God would send you there because of your sins. Remember Jesus' words? I say to you, he says, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you who to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. (laughs) Boy, I'll tell you, when he revealed my sins to me, I cried out to God. I was only six years old. Praise God, he still saved little children as well. I was six years old. I said, oh God, I am a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. And in this present sinful condition, that is exactly where I'll go. I know that. You've revealed that to me. But with your help, I'll turn from my sin. That's called repentance, by the way. With your help, I'll turn from my sin, and I'll place my faith completely in your son and what he did for me on that cross. I believe with all my heart he bore all my sins and you poured out all the wrath that I deserved upon him, your perfect son who bore my sins. And you were satisfied by the payment he made for me and right now I'm trusting him to save me. Listen, that's how a person gets saved, right? That's how a person gets saved, not by joining a church, not through sacraments. No, he reveals your sin to you. And then you cry out to him knowing that Jesus had to pay for those sins and he paid in full for those sins and that God poured his wrath out on his son instead of on you that you don't have to go to hell. And guess what happens? You get born again. Amen? Amen. Oh my. At that point I was born again. I became a partaker of the divine nature and I realized, oh, I realized for the very first time that God had completely forgiven me of all my sins for his namesake and what joy flooded my heart. And by the way, it still does. It still does. That's salvation. That's knowing your father as his child. As the apostle John wrote, go back up to chapter 2 again, verses 1 and 2. To these, what? Little children, these born ones, included all of them, the little children, the young men, the fathers, He says, my little children, I I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Guess what? 
You's going to do it. Yeah, me as well. And if anyone, Bill, including you, sins, we have what? An advocate. A defense attorney. One that has never lost a case. Wow. Amazing. Jesus the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation. That means a satisfaction. He satisfies God the Father for our sins, and not just for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. I want to turn back just for a moment and add to that Romans 8, because it's a beautiful picture of what takes place when you and me sin, when you and I sin. Romans 8, 33 and 34 say, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Well, Satan loves to do it. Your own guilty conscience loves to do it, doesn't it? God is the one who justifies, though. Who is the one who condemns? Well, your conscience, Satan, and so forth. Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand as your defense attorney, never lost a case, who also intercedes for us. What a profound scripture. Learning to know your father as a child. God has completely forgiven all your sins. But secondly, secondly, because God has become your loving Heavenly Father. Oh my. Because God has become your loving Heavenly Father. In the last part of verse 13, John writes, I've written to you, children, because you know the Father. In this verse, oh, John changes the word from children to, to, of technia, to, uh, meaning born ones, to paideia. That's a child that's under a tutor learning discipline. Huh. These little ones are learning. And they know something. And guess what? Guess what, folks? They know someone. Remember when you got saved? Yeah, that's a few of you got saved. What about the rest of you? <laughs> I mean, my, they know somebody. They know about their loving Heavenly Father. Do you remember when He became more than God up there to you? He became your loving Heavenly Father. Oh, how the world of lost people long for that. How they long for that. It is not only the fathers who know God as the Father, their Father. These children also know Him and how great His love for them is. Think of this. Think of that. God is no longer a God of wrath and judgment toward these folk. He has become their loving Heavenly Father. Paul put it this way in Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, that is Aramaic for daddy, father. That's the Greek for that word. And you can't miss how the apostle John focuses their attention on their heavenly father's love toward them in this letter. And he instructs them concerning their father's love for them. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 again, going back over that verse. Look what it says. You should know this verse. You've got to write it down. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. Profound. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. He goes on in chapter 3, verse 16, we know love by this, that He laid down His life for us. There it is again, His love. And we ought also lay our lives down for our brethren. Look at chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, now remember, John's instructing them about the love of the Father. And they're growing in that love and growing in their relationship with their Father. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is what? Born of God. And knows God. There it is. They know God. The one who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son to the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. Be overwhelmed by that love. 
and sent his son to be the satisfaction, the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And then drop down to verse 15 of chapter 4. There he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Talk about that divine nature. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Amen. But because as he is, so also are we in the world. Clothed with his righteousness, overwhelmed with his love. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. I mean, what does he do? John just says, let me teach you, little ones, about how much God so deeply loves you. Profound. Profound. Knowing your father is his child because he's completely forgiven your sins and because your loving father loves you with such a love. Amazing. Well, we move on to the next movement in our text, though. Going back to 1 John 2, 12 through 14. Knowing your father as young men. Knowing your father as young men. John writes, I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Knowing your father as a young man, number one, because you have overcome the evil one. Because you have overcome the evil one. Before we see how John zeroes in on these he described as young men, we need to remember that the little children, the little children, along with the young men and the fathers, all have overcome the evil one. You need to know that. You need to realize that. Let me verify that. Turn back to 1 John 4, 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You've got God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling in you. That's why. Look at chapter 5, verse 4. 4 and 5 there. For whatever is born of God, what? Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, what? Our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Amazing. Amazing. Look at verse, chapter 5, verse 18, though. Don't miss that. Talking about both the little children, the young men, and the fathers have all overcome the evil. Look at chapter 5, verse 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him. That's Jesus, by the way. He keeps you, and the evil one does not touch him. Amen. Add to that, add to that, Uh, What he has to say here, let me find it here, somewhere in my notes. Don't want to miss that. (laughs) I'm getting ahead of my... Oh, here it is. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So all born ones, the little ones, the young men, and the fathers have overcome the evil one. Knowing your father as a young man because you have overcome the evil one. Obviously here, John is not talking about a positional truth of overcoming because they all have done that. Rather, he's focusing on overcoming the evil one in their daily walk and living. And uh, we'll not take the time to go through all of 1 John because he, uh, he sh- demonstrates this in several different ways. But let me just give you two examples of how that works out with the young man and therefore you and me as well. Uh, going back to 1 John 1, 9, what happens when they fall into sin? They are quickly to put 1 John 1, 9 into practice. Do you do that? 
Oh, I hope so. I hope you know where 1 John 1, 9, what it says, and that you quickly put that into practice here. What? When they fall into sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the young men do. Of course, the little children should do that, and so should the fathers. They put it into practice. Okay, God, you've convicted me. I've lost my joy, my fellowship with you. My walk with you is not what it ought to be. I know I've sinned. I feel guilty about it. I feel miserable about it. I'm going to turn to 1 John 1, 9 and confess that sin and deal with it, put it under the blood of Christ. Amen? That's right. That's right. Well, another example, and there's several here. Look at 1 John 4, 1. 1 John 4, 1. And there it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Well, these young men do that. They know Bible doctrine, Bible teaching. They uh, have uh, uh, submerged themselves in the study of Scripture, and therefore they test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Boy, do we ever need that today. Well, this is something that the young men did here. As you can see, those are just two examples. And you go through 1 John, you'll see a whole a lot of them as well. I asked you to give some serious thought to how well you know your Heavenly Father because you have overcome the evil one. What a joy it is. And what an amazing thing it is to know you are no longer in Satan's kingdom of darkness. I wonder why anyone would not want to get saved. <laughs> you know, Really? And you are no longer under his control because of what your heavenly father has done for you. So knowing your father as a young man because you have overcome the evil one. And that brings us to our next point in our outline. Knowing your father as a young man because God's word abides in you and you are strong. Don't miss it. Knowing your father as a young man, because God's word abides in you and you are strong. Again, clearly he's speaking here of practical maturity. John now advances from a basic relationship that every believer in Christ has, from devotion to God, to knowing God's written revelation, to abiding and growing in that revelation, and skillfully using it to combat and defeat the enemy. That's where he wants us to get so we might know him, the Father. Notice how John described this stage of spiritual growth here. The Word of God abides in them. What? They are strong, and they have overcome the evil one. That's the progression. And as you know, God's Word is described as what? A sword. Think about that now. It's a sword. Paul says, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. He says, take it. Get it in your hand. It's your weapon. What does your enemy, the evil one, attempt to do? <laughs> Think about it. What does he attempt? He attempts to knock the sword out of your hand. That's practical thinking, isn't it? Don't let him do that. Stay in the word. Know how to skillfully handle that word. That's what these young men were learning. And use it. And not let him knock it out of your hand. And how often does he show up to do combat with you or me and we don't even have the sword in our hand? That's metaphorically meaning that you know it, you, you're able to use it and, uh, and uh, use it against him as well there. Remember Psalm 119. I know you, do, you know it. Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a young man, I often have put now an old man for me, but how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. And then here it is. This shows his heart. With all my heart I have sought you. See what I mean about the Father? Learning the Father from this? With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Let me help you to better grasp this illustration here, okay? David Anderson writes, and I quote him here, Marriage counselors differ on many things in their approaches to healing marriages. But one thing they agree upon universally, a marriage is most vulnerable to attack from the outside when the couple stops spending meaningful time with each other. In fact, 
In his often referenced work, His Needs, Her Needs, Willard Hartley Jr. gives some fascinating numbers. He claims to have counseled with 10,000 couples by the time of the writing of this famous book. In questioning these couples, he asks each how many hours they average in meaningful time with each other along, alone I'm sorry, during the years before they were married. The couples averaged 15 hours per week. Then he asked these same couples with marriage troubles how many hours per week they were spending together completely alone. Upon, or usually the answer was less than two. So in trying to heal these relationships, one thing they work on the hardest is to work back toward those 15 hours each week of quality time together. I don't think you can miss the impact here about these young men and you and me and our Heavenly Father. Is it any difference with your Heavenly Father who earnestly desires and longs for quality fellowship with you and me? (laughs) Ignore your quality time with Him in His Word, His love to you, ignore that, and you begin to what? Drift in your relationship with Him and your love begins to grow cold. That's right. I don't know whether you have a quiet time, we call it, with the Lord on a daily basis, but dear ones, get back into the Word. There is no alternative here. You understand that? Your heavenly Father through the young men is saying, get back into my Word and let it be into you, and therefore learn how to handle the Word of God as your enemy comes along and you have these these temptations and so forth, and learn to grow in your relationship with me. I long for that relationship with you, Bill, and I long for that relationship for each one of them that I have caused to be born again. They're precious to me. So, Knowing your father as a young man because you have overcome the evil one and because God's word abides in you and you are strong. And therefore, you're walking more and more in a deeper relationship with him and getting victory in your walk with the Lord. That brings us to our third one. Knowing your father as a father. Knowing your father as a father. John says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have known him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. Knowing the father as a father. Number one, because you have communed deeply with your father. Knowing your father as a father because you have communed deeply with your father. Although we have seen in John's letter that the little children, the young men as well as the fathers know, they know the father. But now John speaks of an even deeper, richer knowledge that God, your heavenly father, desires for you and me to experience in our relationship with him. When we consider the Old Testament and those who commune deeply with God, you can't miss Abraham. I love the fact that God came and visited him. And guess what? When you got saved, that's exactly what happened to you as well. God came and he visited with you and he visited with me. And God says to Abraham, you are my friend. What a relationship. What a relationship. Certainly, Moses communed deeply with God, even spoke, the Bible says, face to face with him. Then there's Job and the horrific suffering that God allowed him to go through, and yet God revealed himself in incredible ways to Job, ministering to him that way. And then what about David? (laughs) The man after God's own heart. And listen, he wrote, what, 75 psalms that express and show his heart for God there. And all the things God put him through in order to deepen his communion with him. And we see his heart in those psalms. And also in those psalms, 
We meet Asaph, good old Asaph. He struggled greatly with the prosperity that the wicked enjoyed throughout their lives as they promoted their evil, and we see that all around us, don't we? Sure we do, yeah. Well, he kept his heart pure and vain, he says, and I washed my hands in innocence. Well, he was stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Maybe that's how you feel. Maybe that's exactly where you are. Then as he spent time communing in the presence, deeply communing with his Lord, the Lord showed him the judgment that was going to be coming upon the wicked. And then he did something else. He began to minister to him in an incredible way in that communion with his father. And here's what he says as he shares his heart with you. I love it. Psalm 73. Yes, God will judge the wicked. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. Isn't that rich? I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. Wow. With your counsel, you will guide me. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on the earth. Psalm 73, 23 through 25. That's what I call communing communing deeply with the Lord. Folks, I would call these Old Testament saints fathers. But in a far, far greater way, your heavenly Father has blessed you way beyond Abraham and Moses and David and Job and so forth. All these Old Testament believers, you and I live on the other side of the cross. When God saved you and me and became our Heavenly Father, God the Holy Spirit permanently came into you and me and now dwells in us. God, the third person, dwells in you and me. And add to that, we have God's entire complete love letter. It's complete that He gives to you and me. And he, desi- and he desires to meet us on the pages of Scripture and bless us by revealing Himself to us and by communing richly and deeply with us. He wants you to know your Heavenly Father as a Father and communes deeply and have you commune deeply with Him. But secondly, but secondly, knowing your Father as a Father, number two, because you have learned... Because you have learned to rest in your Father's character. Knowing your Father as a Father because you have learned to rest in your Father's character. Twice John writes that the fathers have known Him who has been from the beginning. It is thought that the beginning John speaks of is a reference to God's eternality. The little children know of their Heavenly Father's fatherly love and concern for them, of His compassion and grace toward them, but these fathers know their Heavenly Father in a far deeper way. They have learned something about His sovereign control over every and all thing, accomplishing His perfect will. They have learned that their Heavenly Father in His sovereignty may allow Satan and evil to prevail for a brief period of time in your life. But in His sovereignty, He will always accomplish His plan and purpose, and it's always, always perfect. The greatest example of such maturity of trusting and resting in the sovereignty of God, obviously, is seen in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As He prayed in that Garden of Gethsemane, and listen to Him, this is a father in a sense of maturity speaking to His Father. Abba. Daddy. Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. 
Remove this cup from me. Yet, yet not what I will, but what you will. I am so glad his father did not remove that cup from him, or you and I would all be damned. Amen. What incredible love. What incredible depth of resting in your father's character, even though it meant something that was horrible to you. Is this not where our Heavenly Father wants to get you and where He wants to get me? Does He not want us to learn to rest in His character even though He may not choose to explain Himself to you or me when He allows certain things to come into our lives and we run from it? Knowing your Father as a Father. Learning to know your Father this Father's Day. I close with this. In 1800s, Anna B. Warner wrote, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. That childhood song is the deepest, richest theology that affirms our eternal relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. We, dear ones, are loved by the Father. We know Him. We know that all our sins are forgiven. We have overcome the evil one. Our position in Christ, our relationship with our Heavenly Father through His Son is so sure and so profound that He declares to us His precious born ones, now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of His glory blameless with great joy. Wow. I would call that a so great a salvation. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I want to close by driving home to you a song. No matter what you may be going through, or what you may soon be going through, that tells you just how deeply your Heavenly Father loves you as he promised you in Romans 8, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, and nothing, absolutely nothing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Join me in prayer if you would. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will learn to know you, our Father, this Father's Day. As we've seen in the little children, we who are here are born ones. And oh God, I pray for any who might be here who have not put their faith in you. I don't know why they would not do that. I pray that you would so convict them that they are sinners, dead in their trespasses and sins. The wages of sin you declared is death and they will be cast into an eternal hell. But you said, I love them. I have prepared a provision for them in my son. They can be completely forgiven. They can know, know me, not as God, a God of wrath and judgment, but rather as their loving heavenly father. Whether in this auditorium, Lord, or by live stream, if there's somebody, anyone out there that has not put their faith in you, oh, would you convict them? Oh, Holy Spirit, bring them to that place of knowing the joy of salvation and the fellowship of knowing the God who created them in the universe, who wants to become their loving Heavenly Father. And Father, for those who are going through deep times and deep trials, would you minister to them as well? Let them know that to know you is to rest in you and you will sovereignly work out your will and they will be greatly blessed as you do that. Now minister to us as we close. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.